I work for Destination Home. We are a small nonprofit. We have six staff members, including myself. And we work at the center of how our county addresses homelessness. Um, we do not provide services to homeless individuals directly. Uh, we do not build the housing that I'm going to talk mostly about, but we work with nonprofit affordable housing developers, with service providers, with the city of San Jose, and with the county office of supportive housing to sort of take a look at our system and say, how could it be better? So, for example, about three or four years ago, we worked together with all of our cities, I think all except maybe one, um, and major stakeholders throughout the county to develop a community plan to end homelessness. And so Destination Home sat at the center of facilitating and convening the organizations to agree what's our plan to address homelessness. And I'll talk a little bit more about that plan specifically. Uh, another example of how we address the system is we used to not have a central database of individuals who are living outside who need help. And now we do for about three or four years. And that's a good thing because that allows us to know exactly what a particular individual's needs are and then to serve them in an order that is most effective and most cost effective also for our safety net systems for what the county spends. So those are some examples of programming that Destination Home does. But I'm not here to talk about any of those. I'm here to talk about housing, as it says, with housing ready communities. This program was named um, sort of by flipping another term on its head. About 20 years ago or so, the status quo in this country was a term called housing ready. That somebody who's living outside who is homeless, what they need first is to fix all of their problems and then we'll have a conversation with them about housing. We thought, so first they need to be sober if they have alcohol addiction problems. Uh, first, they need to take care of their medical needs if they have a physical disability, and then we can talk about housing. Now, as the way that I'm saying it, you might imagine, that was proven to be largely unsuccessful. It did not work. You can't expect somebody who doesn't have a place to take a shower or get to the doctor or have transportation to take care of all their needs before we talk about housing, and that got flipped on its head. And we started implementing something called Housing First. And when I say we, this is across the country and around the world. And so it's since been proven and really means that housing is health care. And so it says first we talk about the housing needs of an individual, and then we are much better positioned to help them with whatever other challenges they face. So that's what our community plan is based upon, and that's why this is called Housing Ready Communities, because it's not the person who's homeless who needs to be housing ready. It's us. It's us in our neighborhoods. We need to be ready for housing so that we can provide this supportive housing that they need. And so that's why it's called that. I'm going to go through it quickly. It has, there are a lot of slides, as I was warned ahead of time, but there's a lot of repetition. That's on purpose. So it'll be quick. And I mostly look forward to questions. So I start with this one. This was part of an exhibit that was in City Hall for a while. Some of you may have seen it there in the rotunda, because it's really important to set the frame. Um, homelessness is really complicated and really uncomfortable. Of course it's uncomfortable for people who are sleeping outside, but it's also uncomfortable for us. It's uncomfortable for us to know how to help. It's uncomfortable for us if we have trash on a particular part of our street. It's uncomfortable for us to talk about it with our neighbors, with our churches, with the people that we live and work with. It's hard. But we do know the solution, and this is not a slogan, right? Housing is the solution to a person's homelessness. And housing really does end homelessness, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So, what is a housing-ready community? I've broken it down into three elements, right? You could do this in any number of other ways, but the first is awareness. And awareness are the things that you already know just because you live here. You see these things. Who, for example, has noticed that there's an issue of homelessness in our neighborhood and community? Right? It's not hard to notice. Um, the second is, is, however, education. There are some facts, there's some data, there's some evidence that people wouldn't naturally know about. And that goes for anybody in a neighborhood or a community, but it also goes for people that I work very closely with. They're focusing on one aspect of the problem. Right? These, this data, these facts are just not that widely known. So the second is education. 
And the third is, particularly in the case of the housing that we need, is action. That all of you can participate to help make this happen, to help us end homelessness. And I'm here with a very transparent mission, is to provide some information, right, that you might find useful in conversations that you have, but with specific asks. And the asks are that you'll hopefully participate. I have a sign-up sheet here that I'm going to circulate later. I gave you some additional pieces of paper with information that's sort of what I'm talking about here. The second ask is, are there other groups in the neighborhood or faith communities or other neighborhood associations that might benefit from a similar presentation? And then the third ask, so sign up and participate, point me to other groups. And the third one is feedback. Help me make this better. What questions am I not answering? What are the things that you're still worried about or concerned about or think would be important for me to mention? So those are the three asks. So this is the outline of the entire presentation. These are the elements of, of within awareness, education, and action. We're going to go over them one by one. Pretty straightforward stuff. I'll just read through it. So first is homelessness and how serious the crisis is. That's obviously awareness. You already know this. The second is about the diversity of the homeless population. The third is housing crisis, right? That's in the news every day. The fourth I already sort of pointed to is that supportive housing does work. The fifth is about the expense of our current program and what's more cost efficient. And the sixth is that we're actually making progress. We're finding homes for people and they're moving in. We're ending homelessness for those people. Seventh is sort of what this new housing that I'm talking about looks like and what does it mean for a neighborhood. And then eighth is that you can make a difference, your participation. So, homelessness impacts people in neighborhoods throughout the county. This slide has some data about how horrible the crisis is here, how we rank versus other parts of the country. Suffice it to say that we're doing a pretty poor job. I think we're number three in terms of major metropolitan areas, just in terms of raw numbers of people living outside. Um, I think we're number one in all major cities for veteran homelessness, and that's with that being an issue that we've worked on concertedly with the city and with the county specifically over the past years, and it's still really bad, um, it's a huge issue, right? And you all know that. This map is just to show that this is a problem that is not just belonging to one of our cities or to two of our cities. People often say that, oh, that's not our problem, that's San Jose's problem. Or that's not our problem, that's Sunnyvale's problem. The numbers you see here are total homeless individuals, according to the last count, which was in January of 2017, we do it every other year, and then per capita homelessness. So in Sunnyvale, there are 1.7 homeless individuals per thousand residents. It's based on census data and this count. And it's important for us to recognize this as a region-wide crisis that we need to address together, and not just something that certain areas need to deal with. Right? Just like I can move from San Jose to Cupertino, the same is true for someone who doesn't have a home. Right? And that's just that's the freedom of our country. So it's a regional issue we need to address together. The second main point is that our homeless population is diverse. When I moved here, I lived downtown and worked downtown. So I walked about 15 minutes from my apartment to my job. And I saw about 15 or 20 homeless individuals, depending on the day, on that walk. But those 15 people are not representative of the entire homeless population, right? It's a very specific subset. And it's important for us to kind of think about what that diversity could look like. These are just some of the statistics that I pulled out that were sort of most impactful for me. The ones that I point out and that really sort of hit home with me is this number of veterans. So 9% of those 7,000 who are sleeping outside fought for us overseas. Um, this families with children number, 15% are families with children. That's certainly not what I saw walking from my apartment to work downtown. Um, this 83%, right? There's often a myth that people come here, wherever here is, um, from far away because of the services we have or whatever it might be. And this number shows that 83% of those who are currently living outside lived here when they lost their home. So yes, just like I moved here a year and a half ago, People do move here also who don't have a place to stay. But the vast majority are folks that live here. The other one that I like to point out is this bottom bar, which is a little bit hard to read, but it shows sort of duration. 
When I walk from downtown to my job, and I can still go down to that same block, and I'll see about four or five of the same people I saw a year and a half ago. However, 77% of those who are sleeping outside have been homeless for one year or less. So this extreme homelessness of people who have been outside for two years or for five years or for 20 years, yes, that's part of the population to be sure, but it's a minority. It's not the majority of the population. This slide is blank because you'll see in my presentation that there are no faces. And I think it's really important to remember that I'm showing you numbers and percentages and little caricatures, but we're talking about people that look like me, you know, that had a terrible accident, that their rent up went up too high, they had a divorce and were being beat by their partner. Any scenario that you can imagine, right? It could be them. These are people who are part of our community, have been a part of other communities, and look like you and, and your neighbors. So it's important to remember those faces. The third point is about the housing crisis, and this is just to draw a little bit of a distinction. We have a broad housing crisis in our community, and we need housing at all kinds of levels. I mean, who has noticed that it's hard to find an affordable apartment or home, or you know somebody who has, right? I'm sure you've heard it talked about. I know I have. I've moved twice, once here and then once after I moved, and it was difficult in both instances. This is getting to this area median income, income that the council member spoke about. Each city has a goal that's set by a regional body for a seven year period of how much housing they need to produce at different income levels, so four different income levels. The lowest level that, is, that goals are set for is 50% of area median income. So a family of four that earns $50,000 or less together, all together. And the numbers show the goal of how many homes each city was supposed to produce during that last cycle. And you'll see that Los Altos Hills did very well. They created 25 out of 27 homes that they were supposed to produce in conjunction with developers and other partners. But 27 is a very low number, right? San Jose's goal was 7,751. And we didn't get very close. But the overall goal is not to throw stones at San Jose, it's to say that these numbers are low for all of our cities. We're not doing a very good job at this income level across our county, and that's because it's hard. It's really difficult to finance this housing. It's really expensive to make it go forward. It relies on subsidies from both the city, now the county, and also from the housing authority, federal government money. And so it's really hard and requires additional focus. This number is about that, these two slides, um, is about that same time period, that seven year goal for our county. And this shows how much was produced for this lowest income bracket and how much was produced for the bracket above 120%. So housing advocates will say that this is low, that we didn't produce enough, and we're in a new cycle now. So we do need more housing at that level too. But in terms of the goals, we overproduced for above moderate. So people making, uh, families of four making above $120,000 a year and we severely underproduced for this lowest income bracket. And you can think about financially why that might be, right? If you can charge someone $4,000 a month, that's gonna be a profitable thing to build, and so we were able to build more of that. And I say we, the community, including developers, market rate developers, and the city. The next one is a really important one. It's sort of the backbone of the entire work, and it's something that people don't necessarily understand or haven't even heard of before. And that is that supportive housing ends homelessness. What is supportive housing? Who's heard of supportive housing before today? This is not a test, you won't be graded or judged. <laughs> um, and I meant to say at the beginning, at the beginning of my career I was a public school teacher, so if my presentation style is weird in any way, it's about me, it's not about you. Okay. Um, so this is just a graphic that we put together about a year ago, one of my colleagues worked with a graphic designer to try to explain what supportive housing is, because it's not very clear from the name what it is. It's a regular apartment, so yes, it's a home, but it's not just about taking someone who's living outside and shoving them into an apartment building and giving them the key and that's it. That's not supportive housing. That's just an apartment, right? What supportive housing is, is it comes with services, in this case, on site, so in the building, to help with these other aspects of their life. So yes, it does have to do with mental health, 
when that's needed. It doesn't have to do with physical health needs. It doesn't have to do with addiction recovery needs when that's present, but it also has to do with family reunification. Family reunification may be the number one way that people end their homelessness. They've lost connection with the partner, they've lost connection with their family, and if they can just reestablish that connection, then they can get the help that they need on their own. Right? Another one is meaningful daily activities. And that's another ask for people in neighborhoods, is after these developments are complete, we need to be good neighbors to help these people sort of become healthy contributors to the neighborhood, just like I want my new neighbors to welcome me. And there are a couple other elements there to what supportive housing is. The takeaway is that supportive housing ends homelessness. And now we get to the pop quiz part. This is where I am going to be taking names. Pop quiz. So how successful is it really? In Santa Clara County, what percent of those who move into supportive housing, so homeless people who are living outside, are provided with supportive housing, what percent of those are still living in that home one year later? You can just shout out a guess. 90%. 50, 90, 70, 100. I guess I kind of gave it away a little bit, maybe. Yeah, some are pretty close. It's 90%. And so the point is that, and that's in this county, that's based on data here. Nationwide, it's the same. In any city where they're implementing housing first, supportive housing, the success rate is between 85 and 95%. And so the reason that this is, this is important is because it's good to know that what we're doing with public money and private money is working. But it's most important, I feel like, to recognize that it's not that the supervisors or the people on the city council who put together Measure V, which is gonna help pay for the same housing, just thought, oh, housing is easy, land is cheap, we don't know what else to do with them, so let's do this. That's not it at all. They identified a proven solution that is much more successful than any other in intervention that is implemented for people who are living outside, anywhere. And that's evidence-based, proven, you can look at the data, anywhere. Um, so it's just important to recognize that like, this plan was thought out, right? It came from two things. It's costing a lot, the managing of homelessness, the way it is right now, our safety net, our jails, I'm gonna to get to this in a minute, but we know how to fix it. So, next point, the cost. So managing this is, is expensive, ending it is more cost effective. This is a study that Destination Home um, commissioned about five years ago, I think. Uh, so the numbers are a little bit old, but the systems are essentially the same in terms of what kind of services are provided in the county. Um, and this is the cost of managing homeless, homelessness in the county for one year. And this is only county expenses. So that's a big number. And it was basically this number that led to, along with political will and people recognizing that we did have a proven solution, that led to Measure A being on the ballot at all in 2016 and probably helped convince some people to vote for it too. This is another sort of, reiter uh, another way to look at that. What you see here is from the initial pilot that we did with a thousand individuals. And the, on the right, these little bitty tiny bullets are all kinds of different services that people use. So mental health help, um, some public security stuff, and you see numbers of utilization. So the number of times that this group of a thousand use these services leading up to the zero point, which is when they moved into supportive housing, and then the utilization after the fact. So it just shows very clearly that the level of services that people need, so there are services on site in the building, and they're using those services, and those are not free, right? We're paying for that. But the costs are dramatically lower when we can centralize those things. This is just a little bit of sort of background on measure A. Um, what it is, there's a lot of confusion I've found out in the community about what Measure A is. <laughs> I, for example, have had some conversations with people that advocate for the rights and housing of workers in our community. And they are, some of them are under a false impression that Measure A is not for them, but it's completely not true, right? The low income, so these two bottom brackets, this is this 30% AMI, Extremely low income, that's families of four, $30,000 or less. And the 50, 31 to 50, so people making between 31,000 and 50,000 for family of four, that's where the bulk of this money is going. And that includes people who are currently living outside, but it also includes just low and very low income 
and extremely low income housing for people that can't find a place to live that's affordable. Okay, now to progress. We're making progress. We're actually doing something about it. It's not just talk, it's not just something you voted for and then you don't know where the money went. It's actually happening. So since 2015, 14, in 2015 in our entire county, we had less than 400 supportive housing homes in the entire county. In December, so already nine months ago, right? We had almost 1,500 with another 800 in the pipeline. Now, none of the Measure A developments have been completed yet. We have one supportive housing development that's gonna open in November or December, coming up very soon. Um, but this is from people sort of looking around the county and finding individual apartments inside apartment buildings that are existing. So this is scatter site. So not in one building together, but throughout the county. And we'll see that on the map. This is an interactive map. It's, there's a Housing Ready Communities Toolkit where you can sort of zero in and look at these specifically, but this shows where supportive housing is in our community. And again, the important thing to note is that it's not just one place, right? It's a value I know of the county. It's a value, it's in the policies of the city of San Jose that we're not trying to create some kind of ghetto or put everything in one place. That's not healthy for that neighborhood and it's not healthy for the people who would move into that building. What's healthy is to share the pride of these communities throughout our community, throughout the county. And so far, that's what's happening. The little box on the top is this new money that voters approved in 2016, the Measure A Affordable Housing Bond. And so far, 10 housing developments have been approved, and those have been in six cities. So we're doing a pretty good job thus far, and when I say we, not Destination Home, not me, but us, the, the community, of identifying sites and moving forward with development in multiple cities. And that's something to be proud of. Okay, almost done. Now we get to the one about supportive housing. I have conversations with people and they think, well, there's this phrase out there, right? Homeless housing, which always kind of makes me chuckle because there's no such thing as homeless housing. <laughs> if you build housing and you put somebody in it who lived outside, they are not homeless. <laughs> so that is not homeless housing, that's a neighbor building. Um, but the confusion is that when people talk about housing for those who were formerly homeless, they imagine stacked up shacks or really ugly buildings that have pure concrete walls. And that's not what we're building in this county. That's not what developers are interested in. We're trying to be respectful to neighbors of all incomes. We're not gonna just build ugly things for poor people. That's not what we're about. And that's not what this money is for. And so these next slides are to show some of the development renderings and we'll see the real thing in nine months and another year. Um, the one that's gonna be finished, if you wanna look at it, is Second Street Studios. It's not funded by Measure A, but it's the same system. And that is uh, Keys and Monterey. So just three blocks south of 280, leaving downtown. This is Gateway Senior Apartments, and this is in Gilroy. They just broke ground about a month and a half ago. That'll be 75 apartment homes. And another apartment element here is that this housing comes in a couple different types. So there's one type, like Second Street Studios, which is 100% supportive housing. So everyone who moves in there is gonna be somebody who was recently homeless. And they're gonna have high service needs and there's gonna be high levels of service on site. But this development is not 100% supportive housing. It's one third supportive housing and the remainder are affordable. And it's also designated for seniors. So it's a very specific population. There are a third who have been living outside and probably have higher needs than the rest of the population. There's still services on site, but then there's two thirds of the homes in this development that will be available for others who are looking for affordable housing later in life. This is another one that's uh, underway. Everyone loves this architecture. Um, this is Villas on the Park. This is two blocks or one block north of St. James Park downtown. This one is 100% supportive housing. This is one in Milpitas. They have really beautiful renderings. Um, and this is close to the BART station there. And this is another one of these models that is not 100%, but 33% supportive housing and the remainder low income affordable housing. And this is also one third supportive housing and the remainder affordable housing. This is Quetzal Gardens in East San Jose. And this brings to another point that the council member also sort of pointed to 
is that these developments can really be anchors for additional community developments or additional benefits in the community. This one, for example, the developer did a really great job of reaching out to stakeholders in the community. Some of you may have heard of Somos Mayfair. There's some other really important community organizations in that neighborhood to form a steering committee, advisory committee, and have conversations about what the community needed. And so, for example, that nonprofit organization that provides services to the neighborhood is going to have another office inside the bottom of this building. They're going to have a community space that can be accessible to those in the neighborhood. There's another development that is happening in District 7 on Center Road, um, I think near Tully, which is because of the, the public investment locally, they're able to leverage state funds from the cap and trade grant program. It's called Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities. Um, for an additional, I think it's something like $9 million, some of which goes into the building, but some of which is gonna go into furthering the trail that goes north from Kelly Park for about two miles, I think. And I think there's gonna be some additional road improvements as well. In addition, the city of San Jose has, when it can, taken some of their existing community block grant funds in order to do additional work in neighborhoods where these are happening when that's applicable. They can't use those funds in all neighborhoods, but whenever it's, it's able to do so. And so there's a lot of additional benefits that can come to a neighborhood with a development that's one of these supportive housing developments. Not to mention that it can beautify a block that's maybe vacant and can inspire other development as well in, to, to bring things that the community might want. So these are the eight points, very straightforward. We have a huge crisis. The homeless population is quite diverse. We have a housing crisis, but it's really extreme for those at the bottom end of the income spectrum. Right? And the reason that this housing in includes not only supportive housing, but this very low and extremely low income housing is because, as you might imagine, those individuals are the ones who are at risk of losing their home. Right? If, you're, if you can't find uh, rent that is affordable and you're making $40,000 a year, then what the market has to offer you can't afford. So we need to build more housing for them so they don't end up sleeping in their car, so they don't end up in their park, so they have a place that they can stay. Um, supportive housing works. It ends homelessness, evidence-based. I encourage you to check out the Housing Ready Communities Toolkit. There's lots of research there and elsewhere. The cost issue that we're making progress. Um, the asset for the neighborhood and that we need your participation. So this is what I'm doing, right? It's sort of going out in the community, providing some information, asking people to join me. And what joining me means is signing up. So I'm pass this around. Got a pen. And there's another one in the back. If somebody can help me start that one. I'll start it here. And all that signing up means, all that signing up means is that when we have a development that needs support, or that we're trying to bring people together to talk about, I'm gonna send you a message and say, when you like to come to a meeting to talk about it. Or I'm gonna send you a message and say, planning commission is considering this. There's some folks in your neighborhood that are scared. Would you come help me try to explain it to them? Or I'm working in a neighborhood and I need to find some new groups to talk to to make sure we get the word out. Can you help me think of some groups to do that with? And I would really appreciate anyone's support. So we're starting with allies. I'm going to all the organizations that already provide information to, that already provide services to those living outside, and then engaging neighborhoods. That's why I'm here. And then the third is the broader public. So the fourth thing that this is trying to do is to really empower you with a little bit more information so that when there's a conversation in your church or at your dinner table or anywhere, that you're able to kind of productively have that conversation. We saw in our community about a year ago some pretty ugly conversations about some of these things. And I think we can have a healthier conversation where we acknowledge fears and invite the community to participate in a solution that we know works. <coughs> these are two of the resources that I pointed to. One is our website, the shortcut is housingready.org. You can sign up there. And the other is this toolkit, which includes a lot of the information in the handout and others. There are other handouts in the back if you don't want to sign up and you just want to get in touch with me, please talk with me. My cards are also in the back too, so I encourage anybody to get in touch with concerns. If you want to get involved, that's why I'm here. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Any questions? Yes. I just want to thank you because I know you talked about ugly conversations and a couple of months ago there was a very ugly conversation on next door 
report, which is the community website, <coughs> this information, we really need to hear it. Thank you. And regarding sort of next door, this happens a lot, right? It's an easy place to say something you're afraid of, where there's no accountability, and you don't have to sort of defend it. Um, and people get frustrated by that a lot, and I think that rightly so. And one of the things that I'm going to be doing in the next couple of months is putting together some kind of social media ready tools that people can share to talk about things in a little bit more productive light. So sort of framing some of the similar stuff. So signing up will be, I'll alert you when that stuff is ready. Anybody else? Yes? Well, I, I just had a question on the affordability. Talk about, um, like for the median, it's 120000 for a, per, a, a family of four. What about a family of one? What is, what, how does that 30%, 100%, 120%, where does a single person, what is that, what does that income level look like? I don't know the chart, but it scales, right? And it's not, it's not a one-to-one -one equation because um, they're talking about households, but those are numbers that are set by the state. And so, what is it, HCD can find this number. And so I, it's something that's less than 120 at the median, right? And, and are, are, are those units available for individuals or just families of four, like the, the, the units that you were showing? Are they more for individuals or just families only? So some of both, right? So this one that's opening Second Street Studios, I think is mostly studios and one bedrooms. And so that will be mostly individuals or one parent with a child. Um, but there are also the Quetzal Gardens one has family apartment homes. So three bedrooms, four bedrooms, two bedrooms. So it includes everything. But it depends on individual development. Yes? So I've just recently become aware of driving around Palo Alto up and down uh, um, the El Camino Real. And it became very obvious to me that there are a lot of people up there who park uh, recreational vehicles, and I figured out finally what was going on is these are people who are living in their RV. Um, technically, I suppose they're not exactly homeless, but I don't see that as a good solution. I mean, are people like that who are somewhere or another parking along streets and just living in a, you know, in a trailer, um, are they being considered at all in, in what you're dealing with, or are they just sort of on their own? Hmm. So there are two, <laughs> that's a really good question. And there are two kind of sad answers, right? The one is that um, I, I mentioned this coordinated database that we now have for anyone who's seeking services. And there's outreach that the city pays for, that the county pays for, um, to make sure that we're talking to individuals and identifying what needs they have so that they can get the services that they're eligible for. Um, that database has about 13,000 individuals in it. Now it's probably not 13,000 today. There's people there who registered and they have been housed and people who have left town. Um, but we're only able to help about 18% of those. So in, in the current system with their housing. And so there are a lot of people that are being left to fend for themselves, right, of all kinds. And the, the safe parking as it's uh, sometimes referred to is to try to take the issue away from just some random street and put it somewhere where they are closer to services, where they do have some additional infrastructure like taking a shower, you know, like throwing out their trash, like all these kinds of things, um, has started to pick up interest throughout the community. Destination Home feels mostly that that is a, probably a good thing for temporary measures, but it only works to end homelessness if we tie it to housing. So while we should find, up, find out better and faster ways to help people with their need today to provide some relief for those individuals, they're not gonna exit out of homelessness until we create the housing that they need. We just don't have it in the community. So it's not an either or, it's a, it's a yes and. And don't be afraid of the uncomfortable conversations. That's what we all have to get over. It gets really uncomfortable to talk about homelessness. Tough for me. Yes? Yeah, I see a lot of people. I volunteer at the Santa Clara Senior Center. Live here, volunteer there. Anyway, um, and a lot of, especially older women, you know, they're living in their cars. These are not alcoholics, drug addicts. These are just people that are living on Social Security and they're not lit up. They're living in their cars. It's really sad. And then, of course, you have the NIMBY problem, not in my backyard. So, you know, yeah, I can build housing, but not here. 
Yeah. It's hard. Talk about that. It's hard. We just need to figure out how to have better conversations where people are invited to participate, right? I feel like sometimes these this for and against dynamic gets set up, and then we, we kind of like draw our weapons and hide behind the barricade, and that's not the way to have a community conversation, you know? And people have legitimate concerns, and we need to we need to acknowledge those and then talk about the solutions that we have. The other thing I was going to say, I lost. Any other questions? Last question. Please. So, um, is there a criteria that you would qualify for the housing that you need to show and how you about that? So, mm -hmm. this is a question that's best answered by a specific development and developer and property manager because it can vary a little bit. But there are standards that I can speak to. So, in general, um, it depends on the kind of housing mm -hmm. And that determines which segment of the population is targeted. So for example, for the 100% supportive housing, as you might imagine, that's more services concentrated. And so the, the portion of the list that's targeted are those that are most vulnerable. You know, the sort of crass way to think about it is, depending on their characteristics and conditions, those who are most likely to die soon, those are the ones who are going to move into these 100% um, supportive housing buildings. Um, then, when you get to the ones that are more family, this third, 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 that is a different section altogether because there's also permanent supportive housing there, but there's also rapid rehousing. So that's a family that you feel like or an individual. This person is not extremely vulnerable. They can probably increase their income and live on their own, but we'll give them this additional subsidy for one year or for two years, depending on the funding source, um, in order to get there. And so it's meant to be temporary. The requirements for the building are very, yes, it's a system, and yes, the goal of the system is to keep people housed. So lots of individual case-by-case -case decisions are made. Um, I can say that, for example, for most of these, not all of them, there's federal subsidy attached to help pay for the particular rent in a particular home, particular apartment, and federal government disallows some classes. So there's not really violent sex offenders wouldn't be able to qualify for any of those. If you have been a producer of meth, then you wouldn't be able to qualify. Um, it raises a whole different question, which is what happens to those people? <laughs> but that's a much more complicated question that I'm, I'm not prepared to address today. But other than that, other than those sort of screen out characteristics, the property manager and the developer and the service provider that's associated with the development, so it might be health trust, might be abode services, might be PATH, different organizations, um, will, will be paying attention to the kind of community that they want to have. They're looking at the specific need. And then it's just a rental application like anyone else. So if I'm homeless and I get called up on the list, then they put me through a review process just like they would put you through a review process in a market rate apartment building that you apply to live in. And then you have a lease, and you're a tenant, and you have legal obligations, and you can't break that lease, and there are rules and restrictions for the building rate. Then it's just another neighbor in an apartment building that needs to comply with their lease. People can be evicted, right? all of these kinds of things. Thank you all so much. If you have more questions, I love it that there are tons of questions. Take my card, flag me, I'll stick around, and we can have more conversations. Thank you so much.